So I'd like to start off uh, just thanking you all for joining us today for what we know will be another uh, informative and exciting Santa's Health webinar. Today, we are going to be unpacking the 2023 Alberta election and talking about what's next for health. Uh, my name is James Mitchell. I'm a senior consultant here at Santa's Health uh, based out of Western Canada in Vancouver. I'd like to first respectfully recognize and, acknowledge, and acknowledge the relationship that the First Nations, Inuit and Métis across Canada have with the land that all Canadians live on and enjoy. I'd like to introduce our panel for today's event. Uh, Stephanie Gower is a principal here at Santa's Health. Uh, she leads our Ontario government uh, relations team. Dr. Zha Hu is a public health and preventative medicine uh, specialist, physician, and family doctor. He's the CEO of 19 to 0, a not-for-profit focused on health promotion, and is a physician with Cleveland Clinic Canada. He has advised the Alberta NDP on health-related issues. Dustin Van Voot serves as the executive director of the United Conservative Party of Alberta and is the past uh, executive director of the Conservative Party of Canada. Next slide, please. So just to go through uh, some housekeeping stuff for today, uh, if you've got questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A function at any time. If going into this uh, today, you've got particular burning questions you wanna answer, feel free to do that right away. And so we've got those for later. Uh, we will be sending a copy of the slide deck out to everyone after via email, as well as a recording of this uh, presentation. We will also be sending out a survey to everyone, which allows us to gauge uh, how, how you felt the webinar went. Uh, there's more content, things differently that you'd like to see in a future webinar and just really helps us out. So please feel free to fill that out. Next slide, please. So about Santa's Health, uh, who we are, we are a consultancy providing first-class counsel and support to clients exclusively in the healthcare and life sciences sectors. Our range of offerings includes communications and stakeholder engagement, government relations and advocacy, strategy and policy development. If you'd like to learn more about Santa's Health and how we may be able to offer support to your organization, please feel free to reach out to me or any other uh, members of our team. Next slide. So for the agenda today, uh, we're going to go over the election results, uh, do an analysis of the outcome, talk about healthcare and what comes next, uh, go through the post-political landscape, and then provide an opportunity for questions and answers. And now uh, over to you, Stephanie, for the uh, election results. Thanks, James. Um, as uh, someone from Ontario, uh, the polling is always interesting to watch uh, happening in Alberta unfold, and uh, it really was sort of neck and neck uh, for the entire um, initial polls conducted in late April, you know, projecting the parties as, as tied and in the lead up to the election as well. Um, I think everyone was watching sort of Calgary, battleground Calgary was determined um, to, to be where to watch and, and where the government would be decided. Uh, you know, while the polling obviously uh, over the course of the campaign was uh, was pointed to different possible results and depending on the pollster as well, um, you know, Danielle Smith and the UCP really held a narrow lead before the election day. So what did we end up with in Alberta? The UCP was elected for a second term with a, a slightly diminished majority of 49 uh, out of 87 seats. Um, the Alberta Party and Liberal Party did not elect any MLAs. Um, and voter turnout, I, I was surprised actually when I was prepping, reading how high voter turnout was, 62%, um, which is a, you know, a down still from the 2019 election, but uh, still a lot higher than the, the last election in Ontario, that's for sure, in, in terms of voter turnout. I think most notably, a number of UCP ministers were not re-elected, and the biggest one for folks on the line today is obviously Health Minister Jason Copping um, and a few others, and I know, uh, I'm sure Dustin is going to get into this in, in his slides as well on sort of who's who are the up-and-comers and, and what's next. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, uh, sort of looking at the majority, um, you know, again, 62% in my head is not low turnout, but if for Alberta, I know it's slightly lower. Um, and uh, I guess one of the questions we were asking is, has Alberta NDP become a party of sort of urban Alberta, uh, sweeping Edmonton, making significant gains in Calgary? 
Um, another question would be sort of what's next for the NDP uh, with Notley as leader? Uh, are they going to be looking for a new leader after all of this? Um, and I think this is the second election in a row where no third party candidate was elected. Um, so looking at sort of what happens to those those other parties in, in the future. Uh, James, I'll turn it back to you for some analysis of the outcome. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, so when analyzing the results of this election or any election, uh, things are open to interpretation. People have different viewpoints on what exactly happened. But in this case, there seems to be a couple of, of key factors and key trends that, uh, that we can point to. So the UCP ran a campaign focused on key issues that they felt would uh, resonate with their voter coalition. So you know, examples include a tax cut for all Albertans, which creates a new 8% uh, tax bracket on those making less than $60,000. Uh, the Safe Streets Action Plan, which will uh, add 100 new police officers to Edmonton and Calgary. They're expanding the Alberta Sheriff's uh, Department. They're making some other me uh, measures on a crime justice file. Uh, they've introduced, or they will introduce rather, the Compassionate Intervention Act, which will allow a family member, uh, doctor, police officer to file uh, a petition to family court. Uh, allowing people to be uh, treated when they're a danger to themselves or others. Uh, beyond those specific issues that they they kind of targeted the, the sword issues as we'd call them, they also prepared uh, shield issues and they were they were able to deal with those. So the main one that sticks out was the public health care guarantee that they made, promising that uh, no Albertan would ever have to pay to see a doctor. So those were the the, the key issues they focused. Going into the campaign, uh, Rachel Notley and the NDP had a lot of uh, momentum, uh, but many political strategists feel that their uh, corporate tax increase, the proposal they were making there, uh, was not helpful uh, to them and their prospects, that it, that it brought back uh, concerns or brought to the forefront concerns of the NDP on uh, on taxes and spending. And in particularly in Battleground uh, Calgary, as, as we've all seen and Stephanie talked about, there was a feeling that the economic recovery in that city was fragile, that uh, that, you know, anything that might jeopardize that was a concern to voters. And so that that seems to be one of the things that emerged uh, from that campaign. Um, so the leaders debate Smith uh, did what she needed. She had a solid performance. She came across as reasonable, responsible, uh, measured. Uh, she pitched to Albertans, the fact that her and her government were making a lot of progress, they 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 progressed in a lot of files. They wanted to finish the job. Uh, for the NDP, Rachel Notley had a very strong performance of the debate as well, but unfortunately, she did not land any knockout blows, which is something the opposition needs to do in a close election. Uh, in terms of the, like the voter coalition, so the UCP has a lock and has had a lock on rural Alberta, small towns, uh, Fort McMurray, Red Deer, Grand Prairie, uh, you know, to Lethbridge to an extent. So they went into the election with a lot of those rural seats sort of on side for them. They were they were able to retain that as the as the election went on and expand uh, their coalition, retain their votes in Calgary and have enough uh, enough votes and enough seats in order to to win ultimately. And then the federal provincial relationship. So I'm, I'm sure it's no surprise to everyone that's been following Canadian politics for the last several decades that there's a tension often between Ottawa and Edmonton about, you know, between Alberta and the federal government. So Smith in a sense, uh, cast this election as, you know, who's going to be the best champion for Alberta at that federal table uh, with Justin Trudeau, who's going to be the one that you want to have representing the province. And so put that to voters as a as a question for them to, to mull on. And uh, we saw the result. Next slide. So polling, so the, the horse race numbers. So over the last six months, it was pretty clear that it was, you know, close up and down. Going into the election, uh, the NDP started off with a bit of a comfortable lead. But as things went on, that started to dissipate right around the time of the uh, debate. You can right around there, you can see the kind of crossover. And after that, the UCP was able to to take off and kind of fin finish as the as the undecided number went down, as the undecideds figured out who they wanted to vote for. That flowed to the UCP, allowing uh, allowing them to get the result they did. So now I'll turn it over to you, Doctor Who. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be chatting a little bit uh, about sort of the, the health uh, perspective uh, from the campaign. And so we'll start with some of the key issues in the campaign. I mean, uh, one of the big ones, uh, wait times across the healthcare system, you know, EMS wait times, surgical wait times following the pandemic, uh, sort of emergency department wait times. You know, I, I think those numbers had fallen from the peaks during the fall when we had that triple demic respiratory pandemic thing. Um, but at various points in the campaign, you know, news of sort of like an eight hour wait time or a four 14 hour wait time on some of the Calgary hospitals sort of did emerge. And so, you know, that remained uh, quite, quite an issue. Uh, another was around sort of the role of the private sector in, you know, in, in healthcare. And there were some sort of more, you know, less substantive and less substantive issues. I mean, all over the headlines, I think were NDP attacks around Danielle Smith saying that she wanted people to uh, pay to see a family doctor, pay to access healthcare, or selling off hospitals. Uh, and we'll get back to that piece later in terms of what the UCP promised. Uh, but that certainly was in the airwaves a lot. When it came to the actual, I'll call more the substantive role of the private sector in the healthcare, uh, there was a, a quite a recent privatization or acquisition of uh, outpatient lab testing in Southern Alberta by uh, Dynalife, uh, which is a private lab company. Uh, and, and, you know, that led to quite a, you know, during, I guess, the post-merger integration, you might call it, uh, there were sort of significantly longer wait times uh, for accessing lab services, something the former health minister, you know, copying actually uh, uh, acknowledged and, 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 you know, so that that's sort of remain sort of outstanding. Something that I, I FL didn't, you know, get a lot of attention in the election, but sort of I think one of the signature initiatives from the ECP uh, was really chartered surgical facilities. And so there's been a really, really big push um, to offer more outpatient, uh, uh, to offer more surgeries in these chartered surgical facilities. So these are sort of publicly paid for, but privately delivered and something a lot of other jurisdictions are, are looking at. Uh, and, and lastly, sort of access to a family doctor, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I think across the country, we're seeing sort of a broad issue with primary care uh, in a bit of crisis and health human resource shortages. Uh, and, you know, I think this is particularly uh, acute in the rural areas, not as bad in the urban areas, but still definitely a problem. Uh, and, and again, whether it's sort of seeing a family doctor or, or other health human resource challenges, I, I think that's sort of something affecting Alberta um, and the rest of the country writ large. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, when it came to sort of the uh, the, the the policy commitments, you know, I, again, I, I, I would say that you know this election was one that was sort of more you know hurling uh, you know attacks rather so much based on sort of you know platform commitments. But I will go through some of those. I mean, in response to some of the things around you know paying to see a family doctor, selling hospitals, um, one of the the big UCP promises was a public health guarantee, which is essentially saying you know we're going to make sure that uh, people do not have to pay out of pocket uh, for healthcare services. Um, you know, I, 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 some of the other UCP promises or, or part of the platform was the Compassionate Intervention Act, um, which essentially allows um, a family doctor, a physician, a police officer, others to, to, to essentially mandate treatment when they're a danger to themselves or others. Uh, and yeah, that was a little bit controversial. I think, uh, you know, people sort of along the I'll say that, you know, <clears throat> uh, the addiction spectrum weighed in on, on that on both sides with sort of different perspectives. And, and, and then lastly, there was the improving health care for women and children, which uh, was, a, you know, a multi-part, um, you know, promise that included things like expanding newborn screening, uh, you know, boosting support for kids with autism and complex needs, uh, and, and increased provision for uh, obstetrical care, including by midwives. Uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, the NDP's uh, probably signature uh, health promise with things called family health teams, really meant to address some of the issues facing primary care, saying that we, you know, connect a million Albertans with a family doctor, but more really, you know, put you know, allied healthcare teams around that family doctor. And I, I think this mirrors things we're seeing sort of, you know, family health teams exist in Ontario. I think we're going to do them a little bit differently, but, you know, and I, again, BC as well, that's happening. So a bit focus on primary care. I also focus on sort of mental health with the sort of five insured mental health sessions for all Albertans. Uh, big push around recruitment of healthcare workers. Uh, you know, whether physicians or nurses or others, and lastly, sort of free access to contraceptives, which is something I believe the BC government announced um, uh, earlier this year. And I think other jurisdictions are thinking of that. We go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I think as we sort of look into what the priorities of the new government are, I, I you know, I think can, you know, wait times, response times, emerge wait times, surgical wait times, and EMS wait times will remain a big priority. I mean, this really was the mandate handed to John Cowell, the administrator of Alberta Health Services, and this sort of something top, top priority uh, from AHS. They, they've made sort of some progress on this, I think. Um, 
I mean, I, 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 I think that, you know, it's obviously a big challenge that every province is facing. I, I do think the issue of recruitment and retention of healthcare workers is something that Alberta and frankly, every other province faces. It's going to be a, a massive shortages, I think, of, of nursing staff all across the country. And so there'll be a lot of competition for these precious healthcare workers. Uh, continued expansion of those chartered uh, surgical facilities. Um, you know, that I think we're meaning to ramp up uh, over the next few years. And lastly, primary care modernization. So, I mean, prior, uh, you know, in the last sort of half year, there was actually a big initiative uh, led by former Minister Copping, uh, you know, sort of to improve Alberta's primary care uh, system. And so if we go to the next slide, we can sort of see how some of those priorities are reflected in, in healthcare spending, right? So above and beyond the sort of $4 billion for healthcare infrastructure, we see money going into the Alberta Surgical Initiative, EMS, more EMS, workforce planning, recruitment and retention, and modernizing Alberta's primary care system, the MAPS initiative. And so I, if I sort of think about some of these priorities, I, I, I think really big prioritization is in dealing with any sort of wait times, uh, surgical wait times, EMS wait times, emergency department wait times, uh, workforce planning, which again, every province is going to be dealing with as we compete for a finite pool of, of healthcare workers. Um, and I think a big part of that will, you know, not only involve training more healthcare workers, but, you know, fast tracking the credentialing of foreign trained uh, people, which is, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say seems to be finally happening across this country. And, and, and lastly, you know, received a bit less attention on the ECP side, sort of the media, but big push to reform primary care um, and to really bolster primary care. And, and, and so, uh, you know, that sort of ends my section. So I think I'll hand it over to Dustin to uh, talk about the post-election political landscape. Thank you, Dr. Who, <laughs> James. Thank you. Um, so the uh, we'll see how quickly um, the government kind of gets on after this election. Uh, looks like we are um, cabinet is going to be put into place tomorrow, uh, and so we'll start to see where the the priorities are for the team uh, and and how that works. Obviously, coming out of the election and the platforms uh, that came out, uh, the biggest one was tax cuts. Um, so that was the real big kind of um, difference between the two sides. Uh, the UCP had a, a tax cut for all, uh, which was a lowering of, uh, of the income tax uh, at, a, at a lower bracket, uh, whereas the, um, the NDP was going to maintain our uh, personal income taxes, which are the lowest already, uh, and then did a little bit of uh, monkeying around with the business taxes, got rid of a small business tax cut, but then increased uh, the main business tax cut. So that'll probably be one of the first things that we work on. Um, there definitely is a real push uh, from the Premier's office on the Safe Street stuff. And this is not just um, crime, it's, it's more to do with uh, mental health and addictions. Uh, the Premier's Chief of Staff um, experienced this firsthand. Uh, he lived homeless uh, in Vancouver for a number of years uh, and dealt with addiction. And so this is uh, a real huge priority for uh, the Premier and uh, her team. And so, you know, you see this across Canada and North America, where we're just seeing more issues in downtowns uh, and it's spreading uh, into transit and other places. So that's going to be something that continues to get a ton of attention in Alberta, and uh, the government is definitely really focused on how we deal with this. We have a real, it'll be an interesting dynamic because in BC, the model has been um, safe supply, uh, and they've gotten exemptions from the federal government about possession of hard drugs um, and increasing the safe supply, whereas in Alberta, there's going to be a real push towards um, treatment, um, and uh, and there's even been talk of 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 kind of pushing on um on the civil liberties issue of where do you if somebody has has mental health issues where at what point do you get them treatment and so i think you'll see in alberta that will be kind of one of the real big issues that uh we're going to face in the next year and hopefully the, i mean one of the advantages of federalism we'll actually be able to see two models um at work and hopefully we can see some real results in terms of uh, how this deals with uh the issues of public safety in our downtowns as well as how um we deal with the health issues of, um, of addiction uh, in our healthcare system. Um, obviously, the growth and diversification strategy, Alberta still continues to be on the roller coaster of oil revenues. Um, we had a good couple of years that made a lot of money, and so it allowed both parties to make some pretty big promises. Uh, we'll see where the, the, the oil prices go. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at on the, on the promises. Um, the challenges, um, you know, the, probably the first challenge of anyone, which I don't know if any Alberta Premier wants to talk about is that we haven't had a Premier finish their term. Uh, he's a Conservative Premier finish their term since um, since, uh, since Premier Klein. Um, and so that's, you know, that kind of first point of bridging the rural and urban gap. Um, it's been it's been tough for Premiers to kind of keep the coalition together. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it fell apart between the Wild Rose and PCs. Uh, Jason Kenney brought the team together uh, for one term, and then COVID kind of broke it. Um, and Danielle Smith put it back together. She ran her leadership on a platform of bringing the right back in and the rural Alberta back in because the party had splintered in rural Alberta. Um, and, she, and then she basically kind of squashed all of the right wing, independent ish um, parties uh, who could have hurt us um, in uh, rural Alberta. And then she won enough in the suburbs to a whole government. She kind of had this plan right from the start and she uh, she put it into place. Um, so that'll be kind of the big one is is her being able to keep uh, our caucus together and uh, and united uh, kind of in, uh, in in governing. Uh, federal provincial relationship is always going to be a huge one. Um, I, I don't think Trudeau and Smith will ever get along. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And so how they manage that relationship um, and hopefully work on some of the things that they can agree upon uh, and while also standing up for Alberta's interests will be huge. Uh, skilled workers on the healthcare front, I, I, mean, I don't think there's anybody who's not trying to do this. How do you do it? Obviously, Alberta had a, an Alberta's calling campaign that we ran across BC and Ontario trying to get skilled workers that includes the healthcare workers. Um, and you can see it in the growth, uh, you know, in, in migration into Alberta is, has been has been quite large for the last couple of years. Um, if you live out in the suburbs, every, every second house is bought by somebody from BC or Alberta. Uh, basically, the house prices in Alberta didn't move for 10 years. And so there's just deals to be made. I moved from Ottawa to Alberta three years ago now. Um, and uh, the house you can get in Alberta Help. This is my pitch to all of you who are uh, living in BC, in Vancouver, or Toronto, or Ottawa. Come to Calgary, come to Edmonton. You'll get a great house uh, for half the price, uh, and the mountains are not far away. Uh, so that'll be a continued push from everybody. Um, and then, of course, the resource revenues is always this thing that it, that keeps everybody anxious. That's something that we don't control. OPEC is obviously putting in uh, not not obviously is putting in some some controls in terms of their production, which I think OPEC hopes will maintain the price. We're in the advantage, the, we have the advantage of when OPEC loses production, we can hopefully ramp up production um, and take advantage of the higher prices. So uh, we'll, uh, I'm not gonna make any guesses on oil prices, but if they are where they are now, then Alberta still has uh, some pretty good purchasing power to keep that going. James, do you wanna uh, go to the next slide? <clears throat> so uh, cabinet's being uh, appointed tomorrow. I don't I don't have any, uh, I, don't, I don't know who the new health minister is gonna be. Uh, my apologies, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. Um, but I do have a, a couple of folks that I thought might be interesting to, for folks to highlight. Uh, if you if you don't know who's who's in the uh, the works for cabinet, um, Mike Ellis, uh, I've put first there actually because he has he's had the mental health file, and so he has been working very closely with the premier and the premier's uh, office about this. And so he's done uh, I think has earned quite a bit of trust with that team, and we'll see if that means that. Um, that we'll see him continue in that role or a bigger role. Uh, the health portfolio, because we lost the minister, um, it is the, one of the premier's one or two or three top uh, issues. And so she's gonna want an experienced hand. She's not gonna want somebody new in the health portfolio. So it's gonna be a familiar face um, and, uh, and somebody that she trusts with something that's you know pretty important to her. Um, AHS, uh, the Alberta Health Services, uh, dealing with that bureaucracy is not easy. And so you don't want somebody who's never had an opportunity to deal with um, the, the experienced people over there. Uh, Nate Lubish, another experienced minister, uh, kind of from the, the suburbs of Edmonton. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we have all the rural seats. We've only got a couple, a smattering of seats around Edmonton and then, uh, the, a good chunk of the kind of the Southern suburbs of Calgary. So we can see him in a role. Brian Jean from Port McMurray, obviously previous leader of the Wild Rose. Um, it'll be interesting to see what role he gets. Uh, Devin Dreeshen, uh, has had the ag and the transport. He's kind of one of those kind of meat and potatoes uh, rural uh, ministers that we've seen kind of take on some of the roles that keep kind of the UCP in rural Alberta uh, strong. Nate Horner was the, the last ag minister and is uh, well liked. The Horner family is a, a long dynasty in Alberta uh, uh, for many, many years now. There's been a Horner in, in Alberta politics. Nate is considered somebody who's kind of a steady hand. He's had the ag file before. Wouldn't be surprising if he got uh, promoted. Uh, Nathan Newdorf was our deputy premier. Um, and was in a real tough seat in Lethbridge East. Uh, was, uh, there was a real battle in that. Uh, and so a lot of resources went into to making sure that he was able to stay on. Uh, and we could see some uh, an increased, well, 
increased role for Deputy Premier, but we'll see where he lands on the uh, on a ministerial file. Uh, Minister Sani, uh, interestingly, she was actually the MLA for Calgary Northeast um, before this election, uh, but due to politics, uh, decided not to run. Uh, and then when Sonia Savage, our, our former energy minister, decided not to run, uh, the Premier actually appointed Rajan Sani to the nomination in this seat. Um, uh, one of kind of, she's had kind of some of the softer files on on, um, on children's services uh, and welfare. And so I suspect she'll be trusted considering the Premier was willing to use her appointment, which in the UCP is a bit of a, a touch and go system because we do have a real populist bent where people run, like to run their nominations and be able to choose their local candidate. Uh, uh, the Premier was willing to use some of her political capital to keep her on the team, which was obviously very important. And then uh, Rebecca Schultz, who's kind of been one of, during the campaign was one of our primary uh, party spokespeople, uh, was somebody who was trusted with a lot of the comms. Uh, she's had some important files in the past and I suspect she will be uh, given kind of some, a very important role going into uh, tomorrow in the next couple of years. Uh, she uh, ran in the leadership and I think surprised a lot of people as somebody who uh, was, uh, was young, smart and a good communicator. So we'll I think see lots of her going forward. Some of the few, so we didn't have, we lost obviously some seats and we didn't actually have that many much turnover in our current MLAs, um, which was a bit of interesting to see how, you know, how, what newcomers we have. So I'll, I'll just talk about a couple. So two, we have two new MLAs who I think maybe it's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, I'll start with Scott Sinclair uh, from Lesser Slave Lake, uh, Aboriginal, uh, small businessman, just a great guy. And somebody people are really impressed about, um, about letting, uh, about seeing where, where what he can do um, from the North. Uh, which doesn't have a ton of representation up there. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what he'll get. Uh, Chantal de Young uh, is a new MLA. She actually beat a sitting MLA um, to take over the seat. Uh, good local organizer, uh, Young, and interesting to see how she does. And then two sitting MLAs who've had kind of more junior roles. We'll see Cyril Turton up in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. This is part of kind of the Edmonton Donut, we call it, the suburbs around Edmonton. Uh, we're going to need to kind of strengthen our MLA representation up there, and Cyril's kind of He's been a, he was a, a local councillor and uh, and kind of well liked in caucus as, as a competent, nice guy. And then Joseph Scow from the Southern Alberta was the House leader, uh, but hasn't had a kind of a real primary role in governmenting. But uh, he was a campaign chair for the party. Uh, the premier gave him kind of trusted him with, even though he had been a, a Jason Kenney loyalist and then even in the leadership hadn't supported Danielle, she's kind of given him a bigger and bigger role. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, where that lands. Uh, what comes next? Uh, cabinet tomorrow. So we'll uh, we'll know who the, the ministers are all tomorrow and kind of what messages that sends about kind of the kind of who in Calgary uh, is is getting more profile, what rural uh, MLAs uh, get important positions, and kind of where the um, where the priorities lay for the government. Uh, chiefs will come in pretty soon. It's a it's a bit of an odd situation here. Chiefs are mostly uh, appointed by the premier's office, um, but if you're a, kind of a if you're a fairly senior minister, you probably get a little bit of say, certainly in saying no. Uh, and if you really have some some weight, you can actually, you know, hopefully pick your your chief. So that those, some of them will be in place almost immediately. Others take a little bit more time, depending if they've had to move portfolios or if there isn't a, a right person. Uh, staffing will happen kind of over the summer. We'll see. I don't, I guess we'll see if there's going to be a spring session. Um, that'll be something the government has to decide if they want to get on right away, or if we take the summer to uh, to spend some time Figuring out what the, the fall legislative agenda is with uh, um, a speech from the throne and all the things that go with that. Um, and then the fall session will be where the real meat is, uh, where everybody's had the summer to kind of figure everything out. And, um, and we'll be back in September and October for kind of the, the meat of the, uh, of the governing uh, agenda. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Dustin. So we're going to flip over to the question section of this. So if you if you have a question, if there's something you'd like to ask, please do uh, put in the Q&A so we can start going through those. Uh, we're going to start off with, we've got some questions that have been emailed in already, so we'll start off with those. Um, the first question, which I'll maybe toss over to Dustin, is uh, what surprised you about the outcome? So I guess what surprised me was there were not that many surprises. Um, a year ago, the party had no leader and we had a leadership race and anything was up in the air, right? Anything could have happened. Um, we went through a leadership review, a leadership race, ended up with a very different leader than Jason Kenney and Danielle Smith. And the result still was 
uh, UCP majority. Uh, and the plan that Daniel Smith had put in place, which was um, consolidate the right and the rural Alberta, perfectly worked perfectly. The, the right wing parties, I think, ended up getting maybe one or two percent. Uh, and so that was something that had been polling quite high uh, during COVID. And so uh, there were the rural seats, there was not a single surprise. In uh, Edmonton, again, exactly what we kind of expected in Calgary was where the, the electoral fight was had. Um, and, uh, you know, it looked like there was, I'd hate to say, like 20 close races. And so for us, we only had to win a few of them because we had the advantage in the number of rural seats versus them, the NDP with the, with the Edmonton seats. And so basically the NDP had to win every single one of them. Like they had just, people called it a narrow path. Basically, if you have uh, 20 really close seats um, and you got to, you know, flip a coin, you know, they had to win, you know, 16 or 17 of those coin flips. We only had to win six or seven. And so even in the, you know, in the war room, you know, when we're talking about where we allocated resources, um, you know, we were looking at what seats do we think are going to win, what seats are going to lose. Um, we didn't get it right. Uh, there were seats that, uh, that we were probably a little bit more surprised in. So we won some seats, probably uh, some seats kind of like Calgary Cross and Calgary East uh, that were um, kind of older neighborhoods, um, uh, probably lower um, economically in terms of house values and demographics. And so maybe those are some of the older PCs who've just kind of always voted for us, whereas some of the newer neighborhoods where we thought, oh, we'll do great in those neighborhoods, young families. Uh, the NDP actually did in the north side, did fairly well in those. So for us, it wasn't about a huge surprises. It actually kind of went really according to plan, um, obviously plan for more. Uh, but this is our, you know, all you in politics, all you got to do is win. All we needed to do was get to that 44th seat. And, uh, and we got, you know, a few to spare. Uh, so that kind of worked out for us. Or Dr. Who, how, on your guys' side, kind of, is that how it played out on your side as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're totally spot on when it came to sort of the narrow path to victory. We we kind of had to win. I mean, we were at 23. We needed to pick up 21 seats, you know, and pretty much needed to win all of Northwest and Northeast Calgary, plus some of the Southwest ridings like Acadia and Glenmore, which, you know, I think we're, we're okay from the recount as well. It's ideally some around the, uh, the Edmonton Donut, as we call it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you know, tempering hopefully some of our expectations was the fact that our path was a lot narrower. Uh, you know, I, I do I do think we, you know, from a purely plan perspective, I we're a bit more hopeful for some of the Northeast writings like Cross and East. And so those came as a bit of a surprise. But um, you know, I think that regardless, you know, the path was a little bit narrower for us. So yeah, you're 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 exactly spot. And we had to sort of put resources into a lot of different writings this go around. It's interesting. I having worked in federal politics, I always felt like the liberals started with this huge head start in uh, in Atlanta, Canada and Quebec. And then, you know, we would be playing catch up. And now I moved to Alberta and we start with this huge rural advantage where it's like, <laughs> all right, we got 30 seats. That was good. All right. Now where else do we got to get them? Um, so on that front, it, it seems great. But honestly, like if you look at, I mean, that polling that you put up, James only showed kind of this year, but last year, the NDP pulled ahead of us for the, well, basically the entire year um, and probably averaged somewhere between five, five, five and 10 point polling lead. And we ended up winning by eight points. And so I'm not sure if everybody's giving enough credit to what Danielle Smith has done which was how she actually has turned it down around. And, um, you know, Rachel Notley was a known factor. It wasn't like she, she's obviously been around this job a long time. She's been the premier. Uh, and so uh, she was a, a very known factor, whereas Daniel Smith was the, was the change. She was the difference. Um, and so I don't know if people are giving her enough credit for just how she's turned around the movement, which has been very tumultuous over the last uh, 15 years uh, in Alberta. <laughs> Steph, any anything that uh, that really jumped out to you as as surprising in terms of the outcome? Not in terms of the outcome, no. But I think uh, it was just fun to watch from an Ontario sort of perspective, and the um, it's all almost daily personal attacks on on the premier, and uh, really did nothing to to harm her from the NDP. So uh, it just proves to you that sometimes those tactics. I think Jaw's going to jump in, but proves that those tactics uh, really don't work and, and don't entice the, the general public one way or another. Jaw disagrees yeah, I mean, I, with I, I, Yeah, I, I think those attacks, I mean, they, they they converted some voters, but not enough voters, right? I mean, to Dustin's point, I think starting with the lead on the conservative side of things, right? I, I think there just was a, you know, a, a firm core base of conservative voters 
um, you know, who I think, you know, frankly, were a little bit scared of the NDP and thought that sort of we were sort of very bad economically. And, you know, I do think we sort of, you know, if I look at some of the uh, the pocket vote numbers, we managed to capture, I think, most of the Alberta pop, the Alberta party vote, but we didn't make as many inroads, I think, into sort of true conservatives as we would have liked to, uh, you know, and I, I think it, it sort of did show the limits of, well, I mean, I, I think going in the attack was probably good for us, but it does show the limits sort of of, of just going on the attack. Yeah, we found certainly that, um, you know, if we could win our base, uh, we would win. Uh, and there were people who were worried about that. And so part of the campaign was about making sure that, you know, that battle for soft conservatives, uh, the debate was really key and that she, you know, she'd been portrayed in, in attack ads as, you know, being crazy. Um, and so when people actually see it, you know, that's the, the, you have to have, you have to see the truth in it. Uh, and she actually came off quite well in the debates. And then when kind of establishment conservatives started to line up behind her, that's when I think folks really started to be like, well, this is our, this is a, this is our, uh, this is the person we're going to back. So when um, uh, Pierre Polyevra, who's obviously very, holds very, very well in Alberta, uh, he put out an endorsement for James Within. So for political people, you think, oh, of course the federal leader is going to back the provincial leader. But for soft conservatives, to see that uh, gives them a real note of um, kind of, okay, things are okay. And then Stephen Harper came out and did a big push as well. Uh, and so, you know, kind of that, that establishment conservatives in Alberta kind of really helps kind of make sure that everybody who's um, worried about it uh, is, 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 is common by it. So you see the, the difference between the advanced polls and election day. Uh, so the advanced polls, the NDP actually beat us in quite a few of these seats. And some of the seats that flipped were based on the advanced polls. So when you see high turnout at the advanced polls and lower on election day, uh, you can kind of see voter motivation. And so clearly the, the, a lot of the NDP partisans were very motivated to get rid of the UCP. Um, and so a lot of them voted in advance. Our folks uh, wanted to wait and see. They waited and see, and they they voted for us in the end. But it took a little bit more time uh, uh, to, uh, to close that argument, I guess. Uh, but that's how, uh, how, how it kind of landed. So just uh, moving into some of the questions that have come in, uh, I guess this one's for, I'll toss this over to you, Dr. Who. Um, any implications from, quote, uh, failing to deliver uh, on the report from the Parkland Institute? Anything you can you can. Yeah, I mean, I haven't read the report, but I mean, I, I think it sort of is a report around actual reductions in sort of surgical backlog and surgical wait times. And, you know, I, I think the issue of private surgical facilities remains quite a polarizing one. Uh, you know, I think if you're on the left, your sort of primary narrative is that these facilities are sort of going to suck resources out from the public system, at least in the long run, leading to sort of no change in the amount of surgeries delivered. I think if you're sort of on the more on the right side, you know, you'd be like, you know, I can maybe run these facilities more efficiently than AHS can run their surgeries. And therefore, I can actually sort of increase the total yield of surgeries that, that are done. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that the fact is, I think most provinces sort of have actually, to some extent, reduced their backlogs, you know, like through a, a variety of means. But, you know, I think in the long run, our total amount of sort of surgical volumes are going to, you know, face the sort of same human resource caps that we've sort of all discussed, unless we can sort of get more bodies into the system, particularly nursing staff, it's going to be sort of tough, right? And, and I, you know, the last thing I'll say is that we generally tolerate pretty unacceptable wait times across the country compared to other OECD countries, even those with primarily public systems, uh, let, not referring to the United States. And so, you know, I think it'll be, a, it'll be, a, it'll, you know, it'll be an uphill battle to ensure that sort of our wait times are sort of within, you know, good, 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 good times. Yeah, it's interesting to see that the battle over like, uh, paid for healthcare continues. I remember Stockwell Day saying, you know, no two tier healthcare back 20 years ago. Uh, and that conversation is still happening. Um, and the UCP took on kind of the healthcare, the NDP did a really good job of bringing healthcare to the front in this campaign and kind of weeks one, two, and most of three were, were really dominated by how the UCP was going to deal with healthcare. And so there's the two fronts on it that the NDP really attacked, which was one user pay and the second part um, private delivery. And so the UCP really tried to use a shield of there will, there will be no user pay um, despite uh, folks in our, our Cox and cabinet having spoken about it in the past, the policy was no user pay. And so that was, especially with a lot of our seniors, uh, they were concerned about that. And so that was kind of a, a big issue that we were, we'll draw the line on that there will be no user pay. There will be no, I don't believe that the government will, will, will tread on that. But on the second part, which is private delivery, the premier I think is open uh, to most forms of any way she thinks that uh, we can get the wait times down. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and for us as a UCP, we kind of looked at it as, you know, if whoever's going to get the job done, that's the way we're going to do it. And we're willing to try because continuing to do the same thing 
we're worried is only going to make things worse, not better with our aging population. So uh, we'll see where it goes. But I think uh, the premier and her team are going to be looking at options uh, to, to do exactly what Dr. Who said, which is get weight teams dime, get more doctors and nurses in the system. Awesome. Thanks so much. I uh, just remind everyone, please, uh, please feel feel free to submit those questions. We, we'd love to answer them. So put those in the Q&A. Dustin, uh, I know you've said you you don't have, you've told us at least you don't have insight into who's going to be in cabinet and whatnot. Uh, but one question that's in is, uh, what is the plan for MLA RJ Sigurdsson? Any any context, anything you can provide there? RJ is one of our MLAs from Southern Alberta. Uh, he was uh, uh, a government member in the back uh, in, for the last uh, session. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those guys that people like a lot. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow. I don't have an answer. I wish I could uh, I could say. Um, I, I just can't. <laughs> uh, but the Premier, I don't know, I think is actually making her cabinet calls today. We'll see who makes it in and who doesn't. Awesome. Uh, Doctor Who, maybe I'll, I'll throw this one over to you, which is uh, what will the NDP opposition's priorities be for health care? Uh, will their larger caucus change their role? I guess the, the question is, what are they going to be focusing on related to health care in this in this legislature? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think that, you know, in terms of what we're focusing on, one, we'll keep a close eye on what sort of the UCP does. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, Danielle Smith has said things in the past that we're pretty concerned about from the election perspective, like pivoted center. So we'll keep an eye on sort of some of the public health care and other things. I think we'll continue to, to sort of, you know, attack on some of the wait times, the primary care things. You know, no government is going to be able to fix these things overnight, right? They're extremely difficult and complex problems to address. And so, I mean, I, I think one thing that did sort of surprise me that Dustin has alluded to it was just how much health remained on the agenda. You know, it was sort of a May election. It wasn't in the middle of winter when everybody's sick or in a hospital, but health was such a top issue. And I think it'll you know, hopefully provide a lot of fodder for the years to come. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll keep an eye on sort of what the, what they're doing. Um, you know, I think in terms of what our caucus will look like, <laughs> we're sort of just sort of, you know, reevaluating sort of what we're doing still. Um, you know, I think Rachel's going to stay on for a bit, which is great from our point of view. But I think everybody's sort of still licking their wounds trying to figure out next steps. What do you think? What do you mean by a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> she lost two yeah. elections, man. Stick yeah. around. <laughs> Uh, she'll stick around for a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different, you know. We uh, we we don't fire sort of our. I guess Jag Jag needs saying he's a lot. He keeps losing seats, and he's still around. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in terms of the next question, maybe maybe over to Dustin, which is how big of an impact was healthcare on the election? Like, what? what it, I mean, it's, it's difficult to rank. I mean, you know how these elections go, but I mean, like. Was it the number one issue? Was it how, how did it rank and how much of an impact did it have? So the healthcare is a, is a stronger issue for the NDP than it is for the UCP. And so if it was the top issue, we were in trouble. Uh, the polling showed the NDP was more trusted with the healthcare system than the UCP. And so for us, we needed to make sure that people trusted enough, us enough not to make um, revolutionary changes, which is what I believe is user pay. So as long as we had covered off that people weren't going to have to pay to see their doctor, uh, then we could move to the issues that uh, we were stronger on, and those were uh, the economy and jobs. And so we had a kind of we would always play off in this contrast of you know obviously we have a, we have two records to compare because Rachel Notley spent four years in government, so did uh, the UCP. Although Daniel Smith only a year of it. It's actually interesting that Daniel Smith really kind of ran on the UCP record uh, during the election that she'd run against in the leadership, but she basically just she never kind of said, tried to say well I wasn't in government. She made a conscious decision that this was the team she was running on. This was who she was. And so, um, uh, so, but if we were all, if we were running on healthcare, we were probably not uh, running on the best issue for our party of where the Alberts trusted. And so we wanted to be uh, talking about jobs and economy where we felt we were stronger, standing up to Ottawa, where we felt we were stronger. And so that's the first couple of weeks actually were like the, the NDP, because we spent last year in a leadership, the NDP actually managed to gain about a $2 million advantage in war chests going into 2023. So we started the year with about 2 million bucks in the bank and the NDP had four. And so the pre rate advertising um, that the NDP advantage had, especially spent a million bucks in Alberta on advertising, it's a lot of ads. Um, my kids can recite uh, YouTube ads, uh, NDP YouTube ads uh, by memory. They've seen so many of them. Um, but uh, so uh, there's, uh, you know, that they really pushed on the healthcare front. Like, it was interesting when Daniel Smith was uh, won the leadership, everybody said, okay, well, she's been on the radio for like eight years. Like 
who knows what everything she said in eight years. Uh, and the NDP really ended up kind of focusing in on healthcare as what they thought was the biggest target. And so when they had the advertising advantage uh, in pre-written kind of those first couple of weeks, um, we really saw that was kind of where a lot of the debate was around. That's where, you know, every time the leader did an availability, that's where the questions were asked. Uh, and so that became a real focus once the kind of the resources on the advertising and the campaign had kind of flipped in and also the priorities of our campaign kind of really started to push. Then we started to move it off of healthcare um, and, and say, hey, these aren't the issues that, that are important to Albertans right now, it's the economy, the jobs. Um, and that's kind of how the, that was the closing argument with, uh, with kind of our voters. Awesome. Uh, so uh, Dr. Hu, this one's, this one's for you. So uh, this question comes in from, from Michael and we, we've talked about Notley uh, staying on. Uh, we you know, talked about the, the, the work that the UCP is gonna do, but one of the questions is, is David Shepard uh, remaining as health critic? And I, I know you, you don't have necessarily have any insights into the critic roles or things like that. We'll see what happens with, with the cabinet announcement, but just you know, a sense on, on him and, and how the NDP is gonna deal with critic roles and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if Shepard will stay on as health critic. I do think, you know, he, he's viewed quite favorably. I mean, he, he did a really good job of keeping health on the agenda, right? To, to Dustin's point, right? I think in Ontario, which I sort of was casually observing, you know, health really fell off the agenda in sort of the post-pandemic state. Um, but, you know, I was surprised actually the extent to which health remained a top issue throughout the entire election period, even, even in the midst, I think, of actually, frankly, improving numbers on some level. Uh, and, and, and so... You know, I think we're still figuring out sort of what sort of the opposition, uh, who the <clears throat> who the critics will be. Um, but, you know, I, I think regardless, that health critic is going to play a, a really, really important role. You know, without health as a primary issue, I think we'd have lost by a far larger margin. And the fact that sort of stayed as a, as a key issue really helped us a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, maybe, Stephanie, I'll, I'll, I'll toss a question to you, which is... Um, what what are you going to be keeping an eye on in terms of health care as the as the new government starts to roll out its agenda? Is there is there things that come to mind mind for you immediately? Uh, I mean, I think we've sort of discussed it all. I think the private private delivery is a uh, number one and seeing again, you know, Jaw, you mentioned this, but I, I think wait times are still a little bit too too much. So tackling sort of surgical backlog, wait times, all of that, and then integrating private delivery uh, of care are probably the number one priority. I also think from, you know, looking at the rest of the country, um, especially being in Ontario, folks look at Alberta as sort of one of the leaders in, in doing this. And uh, um, the other piece is, you know, AHS, monster organization in Ontario. Ontario Health is just getting sort of up to speed and up to up and running. Supply Ontario, all of that. We look to Alberta to see how they're managing things. It's a it's a sort of a case study always for us. So um, yeah, from the rest of the, the provinces, uh, looking to Alberta on, on a number of those issues. Awesome. Uh, so we lost Dustin for a moment to technical issues, but I'm sure he'll be back on. So maybe I'll I'll throw one to to Doctor Who. So um, someone asks there there have been reports about uh, you know challenging the government on wait times. Uh, just you know what's going on in that sense. Um, you know the question of evidence based approach. How how does government kind of analyze all this? Any kind of response to that? Um, yeah, and, you know, the Park Plan and Stewart Report is sort of one of those challenges. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's hard for me to comment on sort of what these people do. I do think they're going to continue to try to push wait times, right? I mean, that is fundamentally why the HS administrator was hired. That is the, re like, his sort of raison d'etre. Um, you know, I think whether or not will be effective at further reducing wait times or stabilizing wait times is going to depend on a confluence of factors, particularly ability to staff people, you know, a bit better than, you know, uh, th th than in the past. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope the UCP, uh, you know, follows a more evidence-based, uh, uh, you know, approach to a lot of these uh, issues. And, and, you know, that's certainly something we'll be keeping an eye on, right? It's always, you know, we wonder is, you know, will Danielle Smith sort of govern as she sort of said she would during the election? Or is it going to be more, you know, the kind of craziness from, you know, uh, when she was radio host or, you know, the craziness even during the pandemic, I think. And then and, and that's something, you know, I think opposition will keep a close eye on. 
Thank you. We've got we've got uh, time for a couple more questions. I guess uh, the next one, uh, Dustin, uh, you're back. Glad to see you back. Uh, we'll, we'll just throw over to you. So uh, the question is, uh, Dustin, Premier Smith has continued to be aggressive with the federal government about protecting Alberta's interests. But how will this work given the need for cooperation on some large health challenges like health human resources? Yeah, I, I, obviously, the in Alberta, we've had issues with Ottawa. I don't know, since I guess Confederation. Uh, but um, this is a real big, uh, important issue that uh, I think kind of the conservative base didn't feel Jason Kenney did enough on. Uh, and so Daniel Smith, that was one of the issues that Daniel Smith had with kind of previous leadership. So she certainly will be continuing to push on Alberta's interests. On healthcare, um, I don't think our issues, I guess we'll see if private delivery uh, becomes an issue uh, with the feds. Uh, certainly in Quebec, we've seen the Quebec government do a lot of these things already um, and basically get away with it. Um, and so we'll see uh, where I think she is going to push uh, that Alberta can get away with or do the same, the same similar things that other provinces have. Uh, and so I think she will push for whatever it takes she thinks to be able to get wait times down. Um, but, you know, do we still need the paycheck from from uh, from from Ottawa? Yes. <laughs> Uh, not as much as some other provinces because we do have a little bit more financial fl flexibility. But now she's going to push, um, and she's certainly not going to be quiet about it. Uh, but does that mean is she pushing for a deal or just pushing to fight? Um, I think she she actually does want to get things done. She didn't. She she's been through a lot, right? You think of she was involved in politics. She was a leader uh, uh, who thought she was going to be uh, premier like 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Lost, then like lost her entire party. And was out of politics for 10 years. Um, so she's been through a lot. Uh, her coming back in, uh, she didn't come back in, you know, just for no reason. She came back into trying to uh, fix some things that she thought were not being done right. So I, I do think she, this isn't just about fighting. It is about kind of making some changes that she thinks are needed. Very good. Um, so Dr. Who, I'll, I'll throw this one over to you. So will there be a focus on uh, pediatric health care, uh, given the issues that we've talked about in terms of wait times, mental health, uh, any insight on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, within the platform there, uh, you know, there was that sort of women and children sort of initiative that, you know, puts the focus on some pediatric health issues. And certainly there were some announcements around Alberta Children's Hospital sort of late into the election, early into the election. Uh, you know, I think it'll depend on, you know, how much of a, a problem it is, right? You know, certainly the Alberta Medical Association has identified pediatric mental health as a, as a, as a, as a big problem sort of in the aftermath of the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, I do think the big priority will wait. I'm not too familiar with wait times for pediatric stuff, though. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, maybe I'll see Dustin. Any thoughts on? I was going to say I, I don't know either, but I guarantee you it's worse uh, out in the country than it is in the cities, and that yeah. will be a priority for a lot of our MLAs because they're going to hear about it if uh, the services aren't there. You know, you do hear about folks having to go into the city for services, which kind of makes sense, but people have to have that level of service. Um, you know, it's been a long time. You know, Alberta for for a long time has provided services in rural Alberta, because that's where the PC base was for many years. So we'll see how that um, that dynamic of, you know, we have every single rural seat other than Banff, Kananaskis. Um, and so those MLAs will definitely be advocating for rural health. And I think that's where you, you, you have seen some gaps in the past, or at least that's where the wait times have gotten longer. So we'll see how that works. I think uh, we we got time for just maybe another question or so here. So I, I guess I'll, I'll put this to maybe maybe Dustin if you if you want to tackle this first. But uh, any comments on how government and or opposition will approach uh, like pharmacare and, and, and things of that nature? No idea. <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll toss it over to you, then, Doctor Who. <laughs> you get what you pay for here, James. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the UCP will approach, uh, you know, pharma <laughs> industry issues. I, you know, I feel like they're relatively business friendly, right? And so, you know, across the country, I, I, I do think many governments are willing to work with pharma, which I think is a good thing. I think in opposition, we've, you know, been willing to have chats with industry, which I also think is a good thing. And so, you know, I, I hope the dialogue sort of can, I, I would imagine, you know, that, you know, you know, at least the, the discourse and discussion sort of can can be had uh, in a productive way. Don't know about pharmacare specifically, but, you know, I think there's a lot of farm industry issues that don't pertain to pharmacare itself. Appreciate that. So, uh, Stephanie, maybe uh, one, one last question to you, and then you can kind of lead us through some some tips on on engagement. But I just think uh, what, you know, one of the questions that was emailed in is what impact will this election have on those seeking to engage uh, the Alberta government when it comes to health care? 
I mean, I think the biggest change, and we have to wait and see till tomorrow, is is who the new health minister is and and who their their staff are. It's been, um, you know, just just working with clients in Alberta. It, it was a pleasure working with the previous minister and and his office. So, um, but a lot can change depending on who that is and, and what staff they bring in. So, uh, stand by for for those results tomorrow. Um, and Taryn, if we can pull up the last slide, please. Um, so just a few sort of things to, to keep in mind it, it, for your organizations. Um, you know, there are a number of sort of communication tactics and materials that should be prioritized if, if you haven't done so already. Um, and uh, congratulatory letters, meeting requests, that kind of thing. Uh, as of tomorrow, again, you'll have a new health minister in Alberta um, a new mental health minister, I'm assuming as well. So um, looking at sort of uh, congratulatory letters to them and any MLAs that you have worked with uh, as an organization. Um, we assume, Dustin, I assume that everyone's coming back for a fall session. We haven't heard anything about a summer sitting um, yeah, this, this year, yep. so we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, and then obviously we, we wait to see sort of the, the ministerial mandate letters, which in Alberta, I believe, uh, have always been public. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, you know, the, the government, which we've had experience with over the last sort of year and a bit uh, under Premier Smith, really position themselves as sort of action oriented. Um, so suggestions to conduct a study or a commission or a report, probably not the best way to animate this government and, and get them moving. Um, you know, easy to understand wins for sort of the everyday Albertan is highly appealing to this government uh, and sort of touching on some of the, you know, broader economic issues, that kind of thing that Dustin was going through as well. Um, and remembering that sort of Smith's government main priorities, uh, you know, what they are and developing your message accordingly. Um, so beyond the regular tactics, you need to be creative. It's going to be a busy, busy time in Alberta, that's for sure. Uh, and to, to get your asks in front of government. Um, so, uh, you know, with a shift in direction and sort of healthcare and because of the pandemic, no longer a massive priority. Um, I do think integrating sort of public relations and government relations efforts is more important than ever before. Um, and of course, we're always happy to answer your questions around that as well. So James, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So uh, just to, to follow up from the from what we said at the beginning, uh, we're going to be sending out a copy of uh, the slide deck. Uh, once this is over, we'll be sending out a, a copy of the, the recording of it as well. And we're also going to be sending out a survey, which gives us a, a good sense on uh, how you think this went. If there's other things that you'd like to see as we're planning more of these webinars. And, and we'll go from there. So if you can fill that out, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Stephanie, Ja, uh, Dustin, thank you so much for uh, participating today. This was a this was a great uh, panel. It was great to, to speak with you all and hear your perspectives on this. And uh, thank you so much all. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take care.